Monday in Tryon, North Carolina, and this uh, series started on uh, August the 3rd, uh, Selecting a Leader. And uh, we looked at the biblical, re biblical requirements for a leader, and we found out that most politicians don't even come close. Uh, of course, in reality, a lot of us in the spiritual world don't come close to what God wants, but uh, hopefully a lot closer than some of the politicians do. In any case, we've looked at the biblical requirements and we realized that, uh, that uh, the U.S. Constitution's requirements for a president of being 35 years of age, 14 years a resident of the U.S. and a uh, born citizen of at least one U.S. Uh, citizen uh, is not a very good re set of requirements for what we really need in leaders today. And so we've been looking at some hot button issues, those issues that tend to divide us and that are controversial. We've looked at homosexuality and we've looked at it from a biblical standpoint, uh, both in the fact that the Bible calls it sin and uh, at the same time, the Bible tells us to love our neighbors ourselves. And so we know that we're not supposed to uh, hate or pr practice uh, prejudice uh, in a special way against them. Uh, but we want to be just and, uh, and also not uh, waver in our values as to what the Bible declares as sin. We looked at immigration and we looked at three facets of immigration. We looked at the existing problem of illegal immigration. We looked at the potential for terrorists through our in immigration process. And we looked at the Im economic impact of the immigration. And we took a hard look at justice. Uh, after all, we have 11 million undocumented illegal immigrants in the United States, and yet there are 4.1 million waiting to come in legally. And what is fair to them? Why should they continue to wait and then give total amnesty uh, with no penalties to the 11 million million illegal immigrants that we already have here. So very complex issue, very difficult to administer any kind of a, a fair and just program. And uh, more importantly, you need to take a hard look at the positions that both parties take on how they would handle this very, very large uh, program of uh, immigration, illegal immigration, and what is just and uh, what the financial impact of all of the different actions that could be taken would be. Today we want to take a look at jobs, uh, which in, encompass a number of different issues. First of all, it encompasses trade agreements. Second, it uh, deals with uh, U.S. companies uh, sending jobs offshore and uh, the technology uh, of uh, the job market as well as labor unions and uh, how each party um, addresses these issues or does not address the issues, especially as it uh, relates to getting our unemployed employed in meaningful employment and uh, educated for the jobs that are available in the United States. So let's take a look. What does the Bible say? Well, in Proverbs, it tells us, Observe the ant and see how industrious. Many times in the book of Proverbs, it talks about uh, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands and leads to ruin. Uh, so we know that we're supposed to work. And uh, we know that through many of these trade agreements, uh, many products have been made available to every U.S. citizen at a lower price because the labor rates uh, in other countries are so much lower than they are here. Let me give you for an example. Back in the 70s when I was working in industry, um, ITT looked at uh, producing products in Portugal where the labor rate was 50 cents an hour. I looked at Taiwan where the labor rate was 32 cents an hour as compared to our minimum wage at that time, which was over $2. And uh, for lightweight products that could be brought in without a lot of taxation on them. Uh, there's no question that they could be made much cheaper uh, in these two foreign countries than they could in the U.S. And initially it looked like it made sense. Uh, uh, they're sending these products offshore for the non-technical part. 
meant that the jobs that were left in the United States were the high paying jobs. Uh, the labor rate would be lower offshore for the menial tasks that even our U.S. laborers didn't even want to particularly do. Uh, and therefore the product could be brought back into the United States at a cheaper rate. Problem was that uh, they quickly found that they could find educated people offshore as well. And the next level of minim minimal, uh, uh, excuse me, of minimum uh, wage was not the only area that could make sense, but that we could hire technical and professional people cheaper offshore. And so those jobs disappeared from our plant uh, in West Palm Beach. And then eventually even the high paying jobs uh, wound up offshore. As a result, uh, the factory closed completely and uh, those products uh, now of course, ITT is out of that business, but uh, those products now are almost exclusively made offshore totally. Uh, and so it went with the steel industry and many other industries. Uh, uh, jobs started out with just the high labor content with low wages over sh offshore and uh, eventually wound up being even the highly paid technical positions went offshore leaving a problem in the United States uh, as we uh, see today. Trade agreements uh, certainly make refrigerators and cars and other products cheaper. My father used to say uh, it's good for the economy because everybody can afford a television, everybody can afford a car. And the problem is if there's no jobs left here in the United States, nobody can have any money to buy these products no matter how cheap they are when they come in. And so there's a balance that has to be considered. Also, uh, are we losing all of the technology that we used to have in the United States as a result of all of the manufacturing being done offshore and none of it being done here in the United States? Are we being forced into being a country that only has service workers and no manufacturing? Unions, how do the political candidates and how do the parties uh, see unions? Certainly there was a time when unions were very necessary to bring safety into the workplace and to prevent basically a paid slavery. On the other hand, did they get so powerful and did they get so demanding that they helped force this offshore uh, manufacturing? A uh, great indication of that would be what happened in the automotive industry. Uh, as wages were forced higher and higher and higher in the Detroit and many of the other manufacturing cities for automobiles for unskilled labor, uh, it suddenly became economic even with the high cost of shipping automobiles uh, from foreign ports. Uh, and then to prove the point even further, uh, some of these foreign companies came into the United States into areas where there were no labor unions and uh, are now mass producing automobiles here in the United States at a lower cost uh, with U.S. labor uh, because the unions are not driving the wages uh, out of sight and therefore with the freight difference uh, they can manufacture cars economically here in the United States with U.S. labor. So it went full circle, didn't it? Uh, so it's a very complex issue, and every time we make an agreement, a trade agreement with a foreign country, every time we think about uh, the uh, loss of jobs or the gaining of jobs, uh, it's very important to the American economy. And uh, So you want to look carefully at what the different uh, candidates and also their parties feel about labor unions and feel about uh, sending jobs offshore. Uh, then I think probably the most important thing as we think about scripture and we think about uh, the total number of unemployed in America is to think about uh, all of the underprivileged people in the United States who are not getting an opportunity to be trained in professions where they can earn an honest wage. And we have so many people on welfare and so many people on federal programs uh, that it's a drain to our economy. Uh, instead of talking about paying for everybody's college, maybe we ought to be talking about taking and going into these underprivileged areas and uh, making sure that these people that are coming out of uh, would otherwise be hardcore unemployed communities and families 
and give them the training that they need to be able to feel some self-respect and some pride in the fact that they can have an education that will provide them uh, opportunities in the job market that exists in the United States. Uh, I think that would be a far better program. So see what the platforms of uh, uh, these different parties and these different candidates are about creating meaningful jobs, but particularly as they relate to uh, creating them down in the area where we have a drain on our economy, uh, the underprivileged, both white, black, and Hispanic, uh, are all affected by this. And uh, you know, maybe money would be better spent down in that level rather than in paying everybody's college fees. That just seems to help those that are already fairly privileged in America today. So there you are. Uh, the, the Bible tells us, number one, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and all of our mind and all of our soul. And it tells us to love our neighbor as ourselves. There's a balance there, isn't there? Uh, a balance of caring about other people and how well they can prosper in America and what each candidate in each party believes is the most effective way to try to help uh, the people of America and uh, to think about what labor unions do and what they don't do and to think about what trade agreements do and what they don't do and to vote responsibly for the party and the candidates that you feel will help America the best in those areas and the candidates that are most qualified to help us in those areas. That's your thought for the day. You see, politics and religion can be a very hot topic, <laughs> but it also could be one that uh, they, they can be examined together. What are the biblical requirements for these hot topics? And what do the candidates want to do? And are they biblically based? Uh, and what they want to do in each of these areas. That's your thought of the day. God bless you and have a great day.